Welcome to the show, Mike Peters. <laughs> hey, good to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. You know, I love your new, I love the new Alarm album for it. It's very personal and I know each song has great meaning to you and I can't, I can't wait to talk about it, but do you mind if we go back in history a little bit first? Of course, of course. Um, can you talk about what it was like growing up in Wales and when you actually started listening to music and what made you want to play? Well, it was, yeah, I guess Wales, where I live in real, it was a bit like a, what you, what maybe Bruce Springsteen was like living in Asbury Park. It was a seaside town and the, the bands in the area were all cover bands playing in the bars and the show and the holiday camps. And that, that was the sort of early exposure I had to music and, uh, one of the guys in a band went out with my sister and he, he showed me how to play C on the guitar. I think he was probably showing it me to get, get kind of get closer to my sister. <laughs> and, uh, and I always remembered the chord. And then one day in school, the guy said, anyone play guitar? And I stuck my hand up, even though I couldn't play really. And I played C and that was it. And I was in, you know, and then there was another guy there. We started a little band and uh, we played at my sister's birthday party and, then never looked back really, and then and then I suppose when I started to buy my first records, that was really it. I bought Slade and David Bowie, and and that was what really got me into the idea. Of, I was going to ask you, band. yeah, I was going to ask you about Badfinger because I know they're one of my favorite bands, and I know they're from Wales. Were they one of the early rock bands that you uh, that were Welsh that you were looking up to at the time? Well, they were from South Wales, and I think at the time we wouldn't have known they had come from Wales. You know, how we got into Badfinger was that, that we heard the Harry Nielsen singing their song Without You. And right. my mum had that as a seven inch and she never stopped playing it for months on end that it was number one for, for months. And and then gradually, at that, I suppose at that time, I wasn't that much of a music fan. I was more of a, into going to watch Manchester United and football and all the 70s running through the streets with the football teams and all that. And then uh, then one day I just saw David Bowie on top of the pops and that was it. And then I went into music full tilt and got started reading the music magazines at the time, like Sounds and NME. And that right. was when you could start to piece things together because at that time, you, could, you, you know, you couldn't search with, you know, without you by Harry Nielsen and figure out, you know, who had written it. You'd, in fact, when I first started buying records, I didn't know what the things in brackets were. I didn't know what songs who, about songwriters. I just, like a lot of people, just thought records a record and the guy whose name's on the record has sung it or, and recorded it and done everything. And uh, it was only when I got, went to buy Slade Alive, which was probably my first album. And, and I looked at the back of the sleeve and it, and it had, you know, records, song titles, and then in brackets Slade. And I thought, great. But then there was one at the end that said, um, Born to be wild and in brackets Steppenwolf and I thought oh, I don't really want a record with them on it, so I did. I bought they, I bought Bowie's Aladdin Sane instead and uh, and uh, when I got that home played it that he was singing a song called Let's Spend the Night Together and when I started reading the lyrics and the sleeve notes there it was in brackets you know Jagger Richards and I realised oh that's the guys from the Rolling Stones this is a cover version okay so. I went back and bought the Slade album because I, you know, that's one I really wanted, and and off that was my journey into rock and roll. But but I was obsessed with being one of those guys in the brackets, really. If truth be told, songwriter, you wanted to be the songwriter. Yeah, that makes that's sense. It. That you've, was it. You know? You've written more songs than most people I've ever talked to in my <laughs> life. Um, when when you were a teenager, and I know we're around the same age, and punk started happening. It's documented that you formed a band called the Toilets after seeing the Sex Pistols. Uh, yeah. what, what, what was that all about? I mean, can you talk about that for a couple of minutes? Well, yeah, we, I saw the Pistols and the, and then that that was, uh, I saw them in 76 before the hype had really kicked in. Right. And then there was just a band playing around. And I, I was intrigued by the name and went to see them. I went to see them in a club in Chester where, you know, they had bands every week, so you just went regardless of who was playing, really. But when I saw the name, the Sex Pistols, I thought, that's a band I've got to go and see. And then uh, they, you know, they were great. They, they were playing things that I knew they were playing Substitute, and I knew that was by The Who. But they played, a, I, I knew The Who from Live at Leeds, and I didn't like Substitute on that. It was so long and guitar soloed up and all that stuff. And the Pistols just played it like a three-minute single. It was brilliant. And they had great language, like Anarchy in the UK. And 
uh, pretty vacant submission. I didn't know what those words were. They they haven't been, you know, I haven't been taught those in real high school when I grew up. So I tried to find out more. I went to Johnny Rotten and asked him what Anarchy in the UK was all about. He just said, "Oh, fuck off, mate," you know, and pushed it back at me. And uh, and I saw the clash not long after on the White Riot tour, and they. I, I met Joe Strummer in the bathroom before the gig and asked him what Right Riot was all about. And he said, it's about the future. The future's unwritten and all that stuff. And it was, you know, and the negative and the positivity sort of sparked me into action to start my own band and uh, call it The Toilets. And um, um, to be honest, I think we were really good. We, we were, <laughs> but we just didn't have anyone to channel our energy. We didn't, unlike the class, they had Malcolm McLaren, uh, Bernie Rhodes or, the Pistols had Malcolm McLaren. We didn't have that figure in our lives. We just had to learn and make it up as we went along and learn from our own mistakes. And uh, and, and so we went to London to play and, and we sort of burnt out pretty quickly and the singer got into some hardcore drugs in London and never never really came back to earth. And But, you know, years later in uh, not 20, well, 2013, I re-recorded all the songs that we played for a, a film yeah. soundtrack. It was for a film soundtrack called Vinyl, which is uh, stars uh, Keith Allen and, and Phil Daniels, who has played the lead character in the Who's Quadrophenia film. And uh, it's a brilliant film. And, uh, and, but, and the director wanted me to record. She'd seen our band, the punk band, The Toilets, and wanted me to, if I had any songs for the soundtrack. So I went in the studio and sort of Richard pretty much copied them note for note and tempo for tempo from one, the one live cassette I had of the band playing. And, uh, and it, it, it sounds amazing. I think it sounds great. So, wow. You know, a soundtrack, you can get it on Spotify and iTunes and that. Of course, Vinyl. I'm going to, of course, I'm going to go look for that as soon as I get off of here. <laughs> uh, and then I know you started 17, which is essentially the members, the original members of the alarm in 1979. And you released a single. And I believe that was your first proper recording when you started to record. Yeah. Yeah, we were a power pop band, really, and and that that was a uh, that was our that was our learning curve. You know, we 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 got to play with the Stray Cats. That was our big education in rock and roll. And uh, we we pretended to be a support band at one of their gigs, and uh, we got as far as setting up our gear on the uh, stage when you know we we it kind of got we got found out. But Slim Jim Phantom said, "Hey, let's let them play for twenty minutes. They've got this far. I admire their courage. Let them let them play." And then we became really good friends and Slim Jim and Brian and Lee took us out on the road and we saw how a band operates at the highest level. And, uh, oh, wow. and, and, and we wanted more of that, you know, but we knew, I knew we weren't good enough. We were, you know, we'd, I'd realized that we'd been sort of peddling the same songs for three years as 17 from, you know, like 1978 to 1980. We hadn't changed one bit. We'd, all we'd done was rearrange the songs or sped them up, slowed them down did a different thing to them. And uh, I sort of came to this realization we were going to be like the Stray Cats. You know, we'd have to, have, we'd have reached three albums in that time. So we t decided to break up the band and tear it all down and go away and rethink. And uh, I wrote a song called Unsafe Building and that became the, the beginning of the alarm. Yeah. Uh, is it true that you guys were called Alarm Alarm at first and John Peel said you should change your name or is that a... Well, sort of, yeah. Yeah, we wrote to him to tell him about our first gig and we were going to be called Alarm Alarm and he said there's a few of these bands like John, yeah, you know, Duran Duran and Talk Talk and now Alarm Alarm. And he says, I'm thinking of changing my name to John Peel, John Peel. And he was laughing away and, and I said to the lads in the van while we were listening, we'll call the alarm from now on, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we don't want to get any more of that, that stuff. So yeah, he inadvertently gave us our name, really. I should have asked you this question before that, but what was the inspiration for you guys using three acoustic guitars and drums as your setup? It was a pretty clever idea, you know, but what, Well, it was just... What... Yeah, when, when we were in 17, we used to send all our demos off and, and we'd get all these rejection letters back from, you know, EMI music publishing and Fleck Warner Chapel, all these various publishers. And they used to say, look, Hey guys, we, we like the songs, but we don't like the sound of your band. You know, it, that's what EMI were telling us. And, and uh, so when we started the alarm, I, I said, well, let's make it, you know, I thought we songs felt good to me on, on the instrument I wrote them on, on the instrument, the acoustic guitar. Yeah. And I just thought, well, by the time we play them on electric guitar, maybe we're losing something of the, the core value of the song. So, um, you know, Dave said, well, let's put an electric pickup in the acoustic and try that. 
And as soon as we did it, it was like that. This is it. You know, what a what a sound. And uh, it, it gave us a, it amplified the inner spirit of the acoustic guitar, but allowed us to play it live because at that time, nobody played acoustic guitar. So the technology for amping up acoustics was was horrible or they look like guitar crimes. If you were playing a, an ovation, you look like yes or something. And it just wasn't for us. So by putting a pickup in it, it meant that we could compete with a Gibson Les Paul and a Strat for volume. But we, and it, I think it changed the way we played because we weren't playing electric guitars, which demand, you know, they cut away so you can get high up the fretboard and do solos. Acoustics don't allow you to get that high up the fretboard. So we were, we had to be more rhythmic in the way we played our guitar and we had to play core riffs that were based out of, you know, two or three notes on the uh, little mini chords rather than, you know, uh, single note riffs. So it, it changed, you know, it gave us a, our own way of playing. Unique. Yeah, you, yeah, unique. The, That's the uniqueness we of the band. Yeah. 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 You mentioned Unsafe Building being the first single. Um when did IRS come on your radar and, and and sign you guys and how did that whole thing happen? Yeah, they they came into it in 82. When we got to London, released Unsafe Building in 81, it all happened quite fast, to be honest. We, we ended up playing with The Fall and then that, that got us into the realms of being able to play with U2. We got invited to do a show with U2 and then that was December 81. And by the time 82 came around, we ended up playing with The Jam. Um, and then things got quite hot for the band and we were, we were getting courted by all these various record labels. But when we recorded the band and we did the demos, it didn't sound great. The three acoustic guitars, just there was something missing. You know, we thought our, in our heads, we thought that we could, you know, mic up the bass drum in a certain way that would pick up the overtones of the acoustic and that would be fill the bass spectrum of the music. But it just didn't work. So it felt like our songs felt hollow and it, it looked great live. And it was, you know, blistering when there was an energy and an audience attached. But when you were just sitting and listening to it, it didn't seem to make sense. And, it, you know, we, we, we never really found that bridge between the drum and the guitar like Jack White did later on in later mm -hmm. in life. You know, he, he bridged that gap without having to have a specific bass guitar. And there's now, you know, a lot of these two duo kind of bands, drums and guitar. But we, and in a way, we were a prototype of that when we started, but we couldn't, we couldn't figure that out. So one of us had to become the bass player. And it was, and, and by that time, we'd lost, all the record labels had lost interest in us. And then we, we figured out how to accommodate, uh, we, we got a semi acoustic bass, like we'd seen Paul Simon and use uh, an Epiphone bass from The Clash. We got one of those, and then it made sense. And then uh, we were playing a gig with the Boomtown Rats and, uh, Steve Tannett from Illegal Records at the time, IRS in America it was, he came, sit, saw us and uh, got us an audition for Miles Copeland and we did a rehearsal for Miles Copeland who was the manager of the police and uh, it was a bit disastrous to be honest. We played in 68 Guns and my guitar strap broke and the guitar fell on the floor and it was like, oh no, you know, what a time for that to happen. And, uh, and then uh, apparently... Uh, Years later, Steve Tannett said, how, how come you ended up offering us a record deal after that disaster, you know? And Steve said, oh, Miles just turned around. There's something here, but only sign them if they're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it was 1982 and we were cheap, <laughs> unfortunately. That's funny. 1983 was a huge year for you with the EP coming out in the stand. I'm sure you must have been happy when the Netflix show 13 Reasons Why used the song The Stand on their show. I heard it. Yeah, I watched it that show and I heard it. I heard it triggered 3 million hits on Spotify. That's That must have blew your mind. Yeah, it was. It, we didn't know it was happening. You know, I, I, we'd, uh, I'd just seen it coming in for our publisher. Uh, and uh, but they, they, you know, we don't own that song, you know. That Brian, I referred to the fact that we'd signed our life away in '82 when, when Miles Cope said, Sign him oh. if they're cheap. We were, he got us for the lot, you know, our, our rec all our records for lifetimes and songs for lifetimes. And it was, it wasn't a great deal. And uh, and so, in a way, that we don't have um, control. So, sorry um, to hear that. Oh. Yeah, hey, look, it's one of them things, you know. Where, <laughs> the, uh, it, we're with a great publishing house, but they own it, you know. So it's, uh, you know, we we make money from it, but the uh, and we publishing, get but we don't control it. We don't own it. Right. So 
you know, we they can say where what films and soundtracks it goes into. So, you know, we just let it ride, you know, and, and see what happens. And then the 13 Reasons Sight thing came out of the blue. So I wasn't sitting there waiting for it. And next minute, you know, I didn't even watch it, you know, and then bang, it's, it's, what's, where's all these hits coming on our Facebook page and Spotify, what's happening? And, and we realized everyone had been watching that show. And because the stand that was at the penultimate moment of the season one, at the right of the cliffhanger moment, it was, uh, it, everyone got their phones out and went, Shazam. And yeah, it's they a all young, the alarm. Yeah, a very young audience, too. A whole new audience for you guys. Oh, it's great. And, and we see them at the gigs now. You know, we get, we get, that's brought a lot of, you know, I think it helps that some people hear it as a brand new song and, the, and they just, you know, like these young, they don't know who the alarm is. They don't got hit. They've heard a great song and they go, wow, this is amazing. They start playing it. Oh, yeah. They, they got it. Oh, well, that's good as well. You know, and they get exposed to our music through it and they start coming to the gigs and uh, it's been, been really beneficial for everyone concerned. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to go through every single thing that you've done in the last uh, 30 years because it's a, there's a lot there. But Declaration was a big record. 68 Guns is what – and the stand, the stand in 68 Guns, you know, I grew up in the Boston area, and you guys were very popular here. So I found out about the band around that time, 83. Uh, and then you put a bunch of uh, – you had four more records, I believe, come out. And then – what? I mean, just in a quick summary, what happened in 91 that made you say, you know what, I need to stop doing this for a while? Yeah, well, we, we'd all grown apart from each other, to be, be honest. That was that was really it. You know, um, two of the members had started living in the USA. I was living in Wales. Eddie was living in London. And, and then we had some, you know, family tragedies impacted on us. You know, there was a suicide in one of the families. And, and we were too young to cope with that. We were too distant. We weren't really close enough. I think, you know, we were living together on the tour bus. But sometimes those environments drive you apart because it, yeah. it's, it's just too much, you know, for young, young bands. Nowadays, I think it's more survivable because you've got contact with the outside world. You've got iPhones and Facebook time and all this sort of stuff, whereas back then you just really were cooped up with some VHS videos and that was about it, you know? Yeah. And, and it was, uh, and, and again, when, you know, a lot of bands, if, when it, it has to keep being creative, it creates a lot of tension because some people can feel threatened by having to go out on stage and play brand new songs. Some people want to keep in their comfort zones and, and it creates tension and that all those things are happening to the alarm. And, uh, and that was it, you know, and, and really, the, 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 the really the final straw, I think, was, um, you know, IRS offered Dave the chance, our guitarist, to make a solo album. Dave Sharp. And, uh, yeah, and he was, that was coming out. And I thought, wow, that was, it's, we've only just released the Alarms Roar album. They're putting a solo album out. I thought, that's, that was strange, I thought. And, uh, and obviously Dave wanted to run with it. So we, we could have gone on, carried on that year in 91, touring with Tom Petty on the Great Wide Open tour. We got offered that. But we, we couldn't do it because Dave wanted to get out with his solo album. And so it was the first time someone had put the, their own thing in front of the alarm. And, uh, and so when we got to the last gig, the, the record company decided to film it so they could keep promoting the record without a band on the road. And, uh, you know, Dave was playing in New York the next night, starting his solo tour. And uh, he, at the sound check, he said, look, I can't meet the... I can't say it, meet, stick around for a wrap up meeting tomorrow. I've got to get on a plane. I'm, you know, playing in New York. And, and that was it. So when the films were rolling, I just thought, okay, I'm going to, you know, say what I'm going to say. And I'm, I'm going to, uh, this, it's time to, you know, bow out of this for the time being. And that was what happened, really. That's really interesting because so many people think that you left the band first. I didn't even realize that. Wow. Well, Dave hadn't left the band, but I th on the night at Brixton, when I made my statement that, that this was my last moment in the alarm, um, I thought Dave was going to do it before me because he got, he stepped up to the mic to sing his song in the middle of the set because, you know, he'd sung, he'd sung three songs on the last album. And, you know, and, and Nigel and Dave wanted Dave to become the lead singer. But they, that, they, they were quite happy for that to happen if that had been, you know, that, if that's what had gone down. And um, so Dave was, was uh, you know, he had a big role to play in the alarm as the lead singer of quite a few songs all of a sudden. And we went up to do one. I thought, he's going to say something. He looked really nervous. And he, he bodged his introduction to the song and he got it all wrong. 
and it's not in the actual film of the concert that's been released. It's, that's kind of been lost to time now, that that particular moment. But I really thought Dave was going to say, I'm leaving the alarm. I've got a solo album coming out and use that to promote his record. But he didn't in the end. So, but uh, I think in, in a way, you know, um, probably spiritually, Dave had probably left the band in, in many ways. But, right. but we're still there. And, and instead of, you know, taking the ultimate step and... Uh, you know, setting us lot free in some sort of way. You know, he he, he wanted the best of both worlds, I suppose. And uh, you know, he, I mean, we're great. We Dave's on our last tour. You know, he plays all the shows with us lately, and it's great to have him there. And he's brilliant, and he loves it. You know, and he he doesn't want to play in the alarm. You know, that's why I'm the only original member. He, when we started the band in again in 1999, right? It was uh, Dave didn't want to do it, and so Nigel said, "I'm not going to do it if Dave's not doing it." And he let me and Eddie carry on. We, we played some dates with Big Country. We put a suffix after the alarm to let people know it wasn't the full original lineup. And then after eight shows, Eddie left because he preferred, he, after 10 years off the road, he realized he preferred life off the road completely. And, and he wanted to get back to the thing he was amazing at, which is a brilliant artist in, in the photography world. And so I was the last man standing in the alarm. And, here I am, still the last man. <laughs> and you know, you you also put a uh, you know did a lot of solo work. It wasn't long after the Breathe record though that you, you were diagnosed with cancer uh, for the first time. That must have been a very difficult period for you. Yeah, it was intense. You know, and I, I wasn't prepared for it in the slightest. Nobody is. You know, you don't go at home at night and read a, a book about what to do if you get cancer. You know, you don't read. You don't have that survival manual in your home. You, you, you think cancer happens to other people. No, everyone on the planet only responds to it when they hear the word mentioned in association with their own name and, and medical records. So it was completely out of the blue. But for, I think in a way I was lucky that it happened on, on the eve of American tour because so I was I sort of had the excuse to run away from it a little bit. And uh, and I, I, I was able to say to the doctor, instead of giving me a bone marrow transplant, which they wanted to do, I said, look, can I finish the tour at least and then come back with a positive mental attitude because if, if I go into hospital now and then and have cancel all the touring it's going to be devastating for a lot more people than just me so um they agreed I went on the tour and you know I bought combat fatigues in Connecticut and went to war on the cancer in my mind and uh, when I came back I'd had a spontaneous remission it felt like a miracle to me and my blood count had gone in the opposite direction and I was saved from having a transplant, but uh, only say for 10 years, really, because uh, I, the medical um, breakthroughs at the time didn't really allow for the separation of certain diseases that were very close. I, my disease very similar to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is what I've been diagnosed with in the first standard. But what I really had was probably le the leukemia I've been living with ever since, and that's uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, in 2000, and, uh, five almost 10 years to the day i was uh, of 95 i was re-diagnosed with leukemia and here i am still taking chemo every day and um you know making the best of life and doing everything i can to stay alive you look great man you look great i'm going to talk to you about the love hope strength charity but i want to mention that i saw you on that tour that solo tour but no no one knew that you had cancer then because I remember I oh. saw you at Mama Ken in Boston. Yeah, that's right. I was and, wearing uh, the green fatigues. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because I think WBCN, uh, they, which isn't around anymore, they loved you, that radio station. Carter yeah. Allen, I think you probably know yeah. Carter. He wrote a Charles book about Edifice. Yeah, th those guys loved you. And I remember going to that. It was a private show, and I got in. And you were great that night, but no one knew no, that you were sick. You know, I mean, it was like, no, I, was, I kept, well, I've kept it completely to myself. You know, I, did, I didn't even tell my mum, you know, I thought my mum would murder me. if She knew I was turning down all the hospital treatment and running away to America. But uh, yeah, it, you know, in a way it saved the life I lived for sure. You know, I'd, I'd have probably, you know, if I had a bone marrow transplant in 95, I, I'm, I probably would have survived, but it would have decimated me in, in lots of ways. And so I'm very lucky to be here now and uh, because, you know, that I, I was able to just get on with life and come back and survive and move forward and then help create the Love Hope Strength charity and, you know, show people that, you know, there is life after cancer.
Yeah, that charity is pretty fantastic. Um, uh, you just decided to start that on your own in, in uh, 2005, no, I think it was. To be honest, I, I, when I was in hospital, having the first proper chemo of my life, and that was in 2005, I was um, cared for by some brilliant nurses. And uh, some of them were, were, you know, they were revealed to be alarm fans. They didn't let on, but they, after a while, they said, you know, we, we, we have our poppies on our wardrobes and all this sort of stuff. And they were like, they kept me alive and, you know, went way beyond the call of duty. And I thought to myself, when I get out of here, I'm going to climb the mountain I can see from the hospital window, which is Mount Snowden in Wales. And I'll take all the alarm fans and we'll raise money and we'll give it to the front line where the, the cancer war is actually happening and nurses are fighting to keep people alive, get them well, you know, care for them and uh, look after them and, and so we, that's what happened. But in the course of going to uh, Snowden, uh, I met a gentleman called James Chippendale who was a bone marrow transplant survivor. And I, I was really interested to meet him because that was something I was looking at at the time. Um, I was definitely having to consider having a transplant. And, uh, and James was from Texas and he gave me some great advice. And he said, look, if you're going to Snowden, why, why stop there? Let's go to Everest. You know, let's, you've got, Love Up Strength is an amazing message. We can take it all yeah. around the world. We've, we've done since then. And, you know, we're both, and myself, Jules, he's a breast cancer survivor. We, we started the charity on our kitchen in the home in Wales. And wow. yeah, we, we've since then spoken at cancer congresses in, in Melbourne, Australia. With, I'm, I'm speaking at the World Cancer Leaders Summit in, in Long Beach, California in October. We're hiking Snowden next weekend. We're, we're doing we're doing the the Alps in in September. My wife took people to the Sahara Desert last year when I was sick in hospital and and raised hundred thousand pounds by hiking the Sahara Desert. And, you know we've been able to support lots of cancer centre projects around the world. And and our charity really gives back to the front line. We we felt it was important that we were um, going to give people care right where they have it in the hospitals and, and not put it into research. There's other cat charities that do brilliant work in that field, but we just felt that we could give something at the front line where there was a little bit of lack of support at the time when we started the charity in 95, 2005. That's fantastic. That's, that's beautiful, man. That's fantastic. Before I get, jump ahead to the new record, I have to ask you about a couple of these interesting side projects that you had. Color Sound. I didn't really know much about it, but it was really weird because I knew Scott Garrett because he played in a band called Dag Nasty that I actually put one yeah. of their records out when I was running this independent label. Um, you and Billy Duffy were good friends and you decided to start a side project. Is that what happened with that? Yeah, we did. We did. I didn't really know him so much from the cult. I knew of the cult. And Billy was my favourite guitarist from a distance, and I always think I wish I had someone like that, you know, in our band. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then we met at a music festival in '96, and the Alarm and the Cult were both defunct, so we just gravitated towards each other. Uh, we loved hiking in the mountains, and uh, we, you know, we were good for each other. We could talk things. I got a better understanding of other people's role in the Alarm. I think Billy got a better understanding of the people he was in the cult with through talking to a singer he didn't have to have any, you know, politics with or, or, or other agendas. So it was good for us to, you know, to, to connect and learn, learn about the roles of other musicians in the bands from a, a collective point of view rather than an individual perspective. And Colour Sound started and, you know, out of the box, it was red hot. And uh, we, we, we got a real buzz and, and we started selling out gigs before making a record and and then Ian Asprey and Eddie McDonald, Ian from the cult and Eddie from the alarm came to see us in London at a packed out amazing concert and next day the phones are ringing let's put the cult back together let's get the alarm back together and it all it all happened in uh, in, in 99 and that's when both the alarm and the cult were, were, were seen again as a result of Colour Sound but Billy and I are still great mates you know he came to the show on Saturday night uh, we're playing with the cult on July the 4th in Cardiff Castle in Wales, and it's going to be a fantastic nice. concert. So, yeah, and there's still, you know, we've made two albums of Colour Sound, and I'm sure there'll be another one in the in the distant future as well. I love your attitude, man. Uh, to, and you also had Dead Man Walking, which was a pretty interesting project with, with like, a bunch of guys. Uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was, again, in, in sort of one of those fallow periods in everyone's lives, and, 
when the, before anniversaries and things like that came along. So we, we it was just a, a bit of a um, a home for itinerant musicians like myself and or Captain Sensible or Slim Jim Phantom, uh, Pete Wiley from Warheat, Glenn Matlock from the Sex Pistols. We even have Mick Jones from the Clash on stage with us. Topper Heddon came up for a gig. You know, we, we had everyone who was anyone seemed to drop by and be part of it. Chris Cheney from the Living End in Australia. And it, again, it, I find it a brilliant learning curve because we learned about other people's music. You know, when we did a gig in LA, we had Duff McKagan playing with us from Guns N' Roses. You know, Chris Shiflett from the Foo Fighters got on stage. You know, it was amazing. So, uh, yeah, you know, that, that still, it still goes on, you know, in some... And it will happen again at some point, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, because we're all still good mates and we're all we're all keeping touch. And uh, But everyone's, you know, the damned are out on the road, the alarm are playing, the cult's playing, Guns N' Roses are on tour. Everyone's playing. So it's, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, was, it was a great time while it happened and hopefully it'll happen again. Those collaborations are fun. Um, I'm going to jump to the modern day. Um, you had another battle with your illness in 2002, and I guess that's when you wrote some of the songs from Forwards. Forwards is a fascinating album. I love how you wrote notes about each song. I don't know if every writer or podcast or everyone received what I received, but it blew my mind. I read them all. They were just perfect. And then I, after listening to the songs and reading everything you wrote, my favorite song was Whatever. I heard oh. that song and I was like, song is so inspirational. Can you share your thoughts on this and the whole John Lennon connection to the song? Because yeah. people will love to hear this. Yeah, I was, look, I was clinging to life last year. I, I, I didn't know if I was going to make it. I was, my, my, the regime of drugs that kept me alive for a long time had stopped working. Because of the pandemic, I, I'd lost control of of uh, the equilibrium in my immune system, and everything went out of control. And I had pneumonia, I, I re leukemia, relapse. I had a chronic lung disease. My lungs were full of blood, and so I wasn't sure if I was going to come out of hospital. To be honest, and one night I, I just grabbed hold of the headphones that were by the bed for the hospital radio, and just to listen to a bit of music, and uh, that was coming from another source of my own choices. And uh, the DJ played. John Lennon's Whatever Gets You Through the Night. And I remember lying there thinking, never mind the night. What am I going to do to get through life? And uh, so I decided to sort of take the idea and run with it and expand with it a little bit. And, I, and my imagination went wild. And next minute, there's this, I had my guitar by my bed. You know, my wife brought my guitar in to keep me going, keep me company because there was no visitors. And so uh, I, I was just able to pick out some chords. And it, it, was, uh, it was the song Whatever. And, uh, you know, it's made a big connection since. And... Uh, it's great. I play it live at the moment. It's one of the ones that goes down a real big, big, it creates another big moment in the Alarm concert. Yeah, I mean, I love the whole record. I mean, Another Way is another great track. Lo love and, uh, fast, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Love yeah, and Love and Forgiveness. Yeah, there's some really good songs, but that one really, really got me good. Um, uh, I know you got to go because you got a gig, but you have two big shows coming up in New York City at the Gramercy on June 23rd and uh, 24th. Is, is it been a while since you played in New York? Well, it, it, but as the band, without a doubt, yeah. 2019 was the last time we were in New York. And then the pandemic seemed to wipe out everything uh, in terms of rock and roll. So this is the first time we've been able to get back properly. Uh, I'm going to do an in-store at Rough Trade. I'm going to, we're going to two nights at New York. We're going to have a hike around Central Park with Love Up Strength. So we're on the Sunday morning. So we're from Bethesda Fountain. So we're going to, and we're going to walk past Strawberry Fields, the John Lennon Memorial. So it'd be remiss of me if I didn't play whatever while I'm there. And uh, we're going to make the most of the weekend because that's what we do now. You know, I'm lucky to be alive. So let's live and make the most of every second we have on the planet. And, you know, we're all lucky you're alive, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I, you. Appreciate, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. And good luck with your gig tonight. Thanks very much indeed. I'll be right. rocking the house for sure. All right, man. Take care. Take care. Cheers, man. Bye. Yes. Hey, thanks, guys. That was great.